Today's title is Christmas, the Invasion. Today is our uh, annual Christmas cantata. It's, uh, we've been singing the same song. It's a great piece of music by John uh, Peterson. Very, very beautiful, uh, I think. Uh, but I hope you don't listen to it just as music. Please, please listen. Don't listen to it as a performance. We're here and we're going to say, oh, that was nice, or our friends did a good job, or that was beautiful. Don't listen to it just as music, but I hope you listen to what the music is actually saying. And I hope that you'll think about it. And I hope that you'll ask yourself a question, what does Christmas mean to me? In your heart. What does Christmas mean when you think of it? How does Christ's birth matter to you? A few years back, uh, Dad's, Dad, where's Dad? Your birthday's in December, right? Yeah. I know Yumi's birthday and my birthday, and I'm doing well to do that. <laughs> At, actually, in the past few years, I've actually forgotten my birthday several times. A few years back at Dad's birthday party, I asked my little iPod, uh, what is the meaning of life? Because I thought that was the best place to look. No. I asked my iPad, what was the meaning of life? The number three answer was, it's a number, 42, exactly. Uh, I don't even recall what number the number two answer was, but the number one answer was amazing. It said something like this, and I wish I had the exact quote, but it was so astounding. I read it out loud. We all, we were all just un blown away by this. You ask your iPad, what is the meaning of life? Listen to this. You've never heard it said this well before. The answer to the meaning of life is in a book hidden on the second floor of the Los Angeles Central Library. Take aisle something or other exactly three minutes and 15 seconds Look on your left, and you will find the hidden book. <laughs> I have no idea what that was, and I've tried to redo that search, and it's never hit on that one again. I'm guessing it had to have been a joke or maybe a treasure hunt or something. But unless that book in L.A.'s Central Library was a Bible, I don't think it had the meaning of life inside of it. This week I saw the movie Exodus, uh, Gods and Kings with one of my best friends from grade school. i uh, been friends ever since. And it had a scene that uh, is actually one of my favorite Christmas passages in the Bible. Uh, you might not think it's a Christmas passage. Uh, you all know the story. Pharaoh is, is holding the Jewish, the Israelites, hot, uh, as slaves. And Moses was instructed by God to get them out of the country. And a series of plagues happen, and Moses won't let him go. So God sends this angel of death. God sends his wrath upon Egypt. And the first, firstborn child, uh, every firstborn child uh, dies, including Pharaoh's own son, which is very, very sad. And the movie was very heartrending. However, God had a provision for the people of, for the Jewish people. Uh, or actually anybody, if you knew didn't have to be Jews. If you would take the blood of a lamb, which you would sacrifice, and there was a meal that went along with it and everything, took this blood and painted it on the doorposts of your house. When the wrath of God was coming over the land, he would see the blood and he would pass over. And there was this powerful scene in the movie. The movie's not like the book, by the way, <laughs> the Bible. And it was not. And there's a powerful scene in the movie where Pharaoh says, what kind of God do you people worship who would kill all the children, firstborn all the children? And Moses leans in close and said, none of the Hebrew children died uh, because they had the blood painted over the doorposts. And I said this is one of my favorite Christmas stories, and now you're thinking, wow, Dan, what does this have to do with Christmas? The, well, the thing is, when I saw that, I saw the blood of Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, fa pa uh, fast forward a few thousand years, and this is before Jesus Christ begins his public ministry, and John the Baptist has the attention of the entire nation. And everybody's coming down to the Jordan River to hear him preach and to be baptized. And Jesus arrives on the scene. And John the Baptist looks up. I imagine he's standing in the water. He looks on the riverbank, and there's Jesus. He points to everybody. He says, Behold, 
the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And a lot of modern people think, oh, lambs are cute and fuzzy, just like Jesus, you know. No, what he was saying is, this is the one who will be sacrificed. And because of his blood, the wrath of God can then pass over us. Jesus Christ was born to be the Lamb of God. He was born to be sacrificed for my sins and yours. So when the wrath of God is coming, if he sees the blood, not painted on your door, but on your heart this time, the blood of Jesus Christ covering your heart, his wrath will pass over you. Yeah, God is scary. And there is eternal separation, hell to pay. But God loves you, and he's not willing that any should perish. And all we have to do is open up our hearts, accept the goodness of God, accept the, the grace that Jesus Christ bought on that cross for us, and the wrath of God will pass over us. That's what he was born to be, a savior of sinners. Well, what does that mean? Who qualifies? Uh, David says, blessed is the man whose uh, sins the Lord will not take into account. That God will ignore that. Well, what's a, what's a prerequisite then for being blessed in that sense? Before that even, you need to be a sinner. Isn't that kind of counterintuitive? We, we know that God blesses us, our righteousness. God blesses our faithfulness. God blesses us when we walk in him. Uh, so we know that God blesses us when we, when we try to obediently serve him. But the first step to be receiving blessings from God is admitting, I'm a sinner. Lord, save me. So who doesn't qualify? <laughs> and then Bob had it next. Next, you've got to believe it. Grab a hold of that grace that God offers us in freedom. So if you ever think, I don't deserve God's blessing because I'm a sinner, you've got it all wrong. You've got to understand you're a sinner before you can even start to get God's blessing. If you ever think, I'm pretty good, therefore God should bless me, then you're in trouble. So the, the very first step is to understand we need a Savior. Otherwise, we'll never reach out and, and grab a hold of the Savior's hand when he's reaching down to save us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody's tracking, right? I'm not saying sin is good, right? Sin is bad. If, if we didn't have sin, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. Sin is bad. It has a huge price to pay. That's why only Jesus could pay that price. Sin is bad. But in order to grab a hold of that Savior, you've got to know you're a sinner. You've got to know that you needed saving. That's Christmas. That little boy was born in order to die for your sins. Take responsibility of the punishment Take, take on himself the punishment that we deserve. Take responsibility for all of our nastiness. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. No, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 3 through 11. Don't do anything for selfish purposes. He's talking to Christians now. He's not talking to non-Christians. If you're not a Christian, uh, you're, you're not following Jesus Christ, right? If you're following Jesus Christ, here's what God says. And he doesn't give suggestions. God gives commands. Who does he think he is? He thinks he's God. He's, he's right. Uh, God says, don't do anything for... S <coughs> I need a drink. Uh, what do you girls bring me my water, please? I think it's... Thank you. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility, think of others better than yourselves. Jay, I got you up here so everybody can see your pretty dress. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Now you're thinking, how do I know which girl? Because they're all pretty. So I could have said that whoever came up. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, uh, 3 through 11. God has commands, don't do anything for selfish purposes. Uh, we're not here on this planet just to fulfill ourselves, That's a myth. That's a dangerous lie from Satan. And we always say, don't buy what the devil's selling. 
but with humility, think of others better for yourselves. And you might be thinking, well, it's easy for God to say he's a big deal. Uh, he can tell us to be humble, but I don't want to be humble. I don't want to humble myself to anybody. How do you know if you're humble? How do you react when people treat you like a servant? Well, how dare they, right? Well, that's because we're not humble. We need to be more humble. Uh, verse 4, instead, each person watching, instead of each person looking out for only their own good, watch out for each other's good. And then it says, adapt the attitude that, adopt the attitude uh, that was in Christ Jesus. Uh-oh. So God's saying, do like I do. I was once talking to somebody, and this is a Christian, but I've heard uh, Muslims say a similar thing before. Uh, God is great, how can he be humble? And I said, well, uh, God is great, and there ain't nobody more humble than him. He's the best at everything, and he's the most humble of all. Jesus Christ humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ humbled himself to even be born in a manger. So it says, Ad adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, and by becoming like human beings when he found himself in the form of a human. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, a Christian ought not to say that God is not humble, shouldn't he? That was just way out of line. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so the name of Jesus everyone in earth in heaven and on earth and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So our, our God is not only glorious and high and lifted up, he's the most humble of all. He set aside his glory. He emptied himself of all the prerequisites, uh, uh, all the honors of, of being God. He's, he, he left the glory of heaven and he was born a little baby that was dependent on his mama to wipe his drool and his behind, who needed his diapers changed, who needed to be burped. He, he, he was probably passed around. He probably had his cheeks grabbed by all the aunts and uncles, right? And everybody's smooching him. He grew up for the purpose of dying for you. How dare we take Christmas uh, casually? How dare, we, how dare we live inappropriate, uh, unthankful lives? Jesus died for you because he loves you and he wants to be with you. And that's what Christmas is all about. The amen. And the Old Testament speaks of the coming of Christ. The prophet Isaiah said years before Jesus was born in, in, in uh, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called. Listen, he will be called. This is a prophecy of a baby that's going to be born he will be called Wonderful. He will be called Counselor. He will be called Mighty God. What? A baby is going to be called Mighty God? He's going to be called Everlasting Father. What? He's going to be called Prince of Peace. This is your God. This was prophesied in, angel, in ages past. That's quite a baby. He came, to, he came the world to bless when Christ was born in a lowly manger, something huge was going on, something so momentous, so important, so beyond conceptualization that it was impossible for the human eye to take it all in. If you saw it, you would not have been able to know what you're seeing. It was beyond the power of the human mind to fully grasp. Like the TARDIS, it was larger on the inside than on the outside. God allowed himself to be wrapped up in flesh. God set aside his glory and was born as a baby in a cattle stall. The king of kings born on that first Christmas day. C.S. Lewis wrote in 1956, Once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. And in mere Christianity, he wrote, The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Christmas is the invasion God saw a world that's full of tears and heartache and disappointment and sorrow and, and things don't go the way we want. And, and with each passing day, the joints creak a little bit more, we get a little more gray, we have trouble with our heart, with our indigestion. We, each passing day, things tend to break down a little bit more. And God 
broke into this world of divorce and abortion and war and starvation because government is inept. And he came into this world with all of the horrors that humanity can, ten, can wreck upon itself. And God says, I'm doing this because I'm going to do something about it. You're not hopeless. I haven't written you off. I'm going to pay for your sin, and I'm going to provide a way out. And God doesn't care what we've done, and God doesn't care where we've been, because he loves us, and he says, come to me, and we're going to, I'm going to separate from your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I'm going to forget about it. I will no longer hold your sins against you, because you're going to be my children. This is what Christmas means. Christmas is the invasion of light into darkness. The crucifixion is the decisive battle. So Christmas is the invasion. The crucifixion is the decisive battle. And the resurrection marks the beginning of the end for all the forces of darkness. Christmas means life over death. Christmas means humility over pride, hope over help hopelessness. Christmas was the invasion because of Christmas God had secured Beyond a doubt that goodness would prevail in the universe, we live in a universe where love wins. That death is not the end. That being humble really is better than being arrogant. That the meek will inherit the earth. That we don't have to cling to false hopes in a damned world, desperately holding on to dreams that we know are not true, just to try and stave off the depression and the madness. A website called the Catholic Education Research Center had this to say about True Christmas. The world has an ingenious ability to attach itself to what Christians believe, tame it, and subvert it. And then turn it against the very people who continue to believe. Too many Americans don't really celebrate Christmas. They may think they do, but they don't. Brothers and sisters, this year, don't try to tame Christmas. It's not about talking snowmen, flying reindeer, maxed out credit cards, and colored lights. And happy holidays. It's the revelation of a fierce God with a fierce love who cared desperately for us with an undying love and desired so passionately to be with us that he invaded this world of tears and heartache and sickness and death it was born humbly as a helpless baby, born and able to, in order to take on himself the punishment we deserve, born to die and raise again in victory. Stop playing marbles with diamonds. I've been repeating this phrase a couple times in the last few weeks. Playing life. We've got these diamonds, these beautiful truths, and we act like it's a game. Stop believing in a milk toast Christmas. Why settle for tinfoil playthings when the golden reality is right before us? Why try to vainly comfort ourselves with stories we know our lies when the author of reality stands right before us with open arms? Brothers and sisters, my strength it is illusion. My faith is weak. My love is not what it should be. My goodness is like filthy rags. But my Savior has called me to his side. I answered that call. He said, come to me. My burden is light. And I said, I'll take that. It says, all who call upon my name will be saved. And I said, I'll take that. I don't see hope here. I don't see hope here. I'll take that. He has forgiven me. He's included me in his victory. I have his goodness. His blood applied to my heart. I have his life. I have his love. And I believe it. And because of that, this morning, I'm standing on solid ground. Ground he was born to gain and ground he bought with his own blood. He's wonderful and he will reign forever. And someday in heaven's glory, we'll see the scars he bore for us so that we can be forgiven and we can be his people for all eternity. If you haven't taken that yet, take it this morning. Brothers and sisters, if you want to pray while you listen to the choir cantata this morning, you're more than welcome, but please give it your full attention and listen to the words, not just the beauty. Amen.
Jesus was on this wise when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy
Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step Leave your comfort zone at home. Uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home. But we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So... Uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.